This podcast is brought to you by ORCHSE Strategies, an industry leader in developing innovative, sustainable approaches for protecting workers and the environment. And a big thank you for their sponsorship to the Pre-Accident Podcast. ORCHSE's main focus and passion is in fostering EHS performance excellence in all their companies. When members participate in one or more of ORCHSE's nine different specialized networks, or if they engage in one of their task force or working groups, something very special happens. The sharing of ideas frequently results in cutting-edge solutions that have practical applications immediately. For example, ORC has been at the forefront of efforts to create new approaches for fatal and serious injury prevention and has helped plan, conduct, and create conferences on human and organizational performance. If you're interested in learning more about the unique opportunities available through ORCHSE, please contact our buddy Linda Haney at 202-510-0509. Or if you'd rather pop her an email, it's lynda.haney, L-I-N-D-A dot H-A-N-E-Y at O-R-C-H-S-E dot com. Now, let's listen to the podcast. Todd, this is Tony. Can you hear me? Yeah, you sound good. You sound younger and hipper, Tony. <clears throat> Yeah, I just took a young pill today. <laughs> Can you send some of those out to us? Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Pre-Accident Podcast. I am your loving host, Todd Conklin. Howdy, 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 howdy. Oh, it's good to be back on the old podcast microphone. I had a week off there where... I laid in the sun. Actually, no, you know, I did a cruise, uh, my whole family, big family affair, did a cruise to Alaska. Even though I go to Alaska a lot, and I love Alaska, so no problems there. But the cruise was really fun. It was an inner, pa- is it that what it's called? In- inside passage, inside passage cruise. But it wasn't just the normal old inside passage cruise. We took one day and went to this place called the Hubbard Glacier. And they took this cruise ship. It wasn't a big one. It was like a kind of a medium-sized cruise ship. And they parked it in this big cove. And we sat there for several hours and just watched this giant glacier calve off icebergs, which sounds kind of boring, but in fact is quite the opposite of boring. It's, it's super exciting. It was beautiful. It's interesting. It makes you think about life and the world and creation and global warming and oh my gosh, there's just so many things. It was really fun. It was a great time. Uh, I did it again in a minute and to spend with my family and my parent, the whole gang was there. So it was, it was a great time. But I missed you. I mean, that's the point of this entire story. Is without you in my life, my life is meaningless. You complete me and the podcast. So thanks for listening. I hope everything's going great. Today's podcast is a uh, super. Uh, it's an experiment. Let's call it that. It, it's actually a, uh, it's like a panel discussion. Now it's no secret that at conferences, I'm not a giant fan of panel discussions. Um, I, I just, I don't know. They, they seem like a great idea in theory, but in practice, they're kind of awkward and they're awkward to watch. They're really awkward to be a part of. Like when you sit on the panel, cause you don't want to say too much, but you don't want to not say enough and you have to find the balance. But anyway, as much as I could say about panel discussions, this podcast is actually a panel discussion. And, and let me tell you the origin of this discussion. I got an email that said, I'm not 100% convinced on this error thing you talk about. I do talk about human error a lot. And the request was to bring some people together and to actually debate this topic. And so that's exactly what happens. You are about to enjoy Bill Rigo, Tony Mashara, Ivan Puppolitti. Bob Edwards, and myself, Todrick von Konklenstein, as we have a discussion around this notion of what is error and how does error impact us? How do we define it? Is it important? Is it manageable? Is it a choice? All the things that I harp on all the time are a part of this very conversation. Now, I'm not going to say much more other than technically this was kind of a mess. You'll see as you listen, but I think it's going to be okay. I mean, I feel pretty good about it. Listen carefully. I'm not sure we come to a conclusion, but I do know we didn't end up hating each other. 
But there are some very divergent opinions on this topic, and there are some clear biases, and all of it is important. I don't know if any of it is right. You have to be the judge of that. So without further ado, please sit back and relax as you hear the panel talk about human error. This is a this is a great discussion, and I think it's equally distributed. We'll see uh, here in a moment around the notion of human error. And so I'm going to make a statement, and you guys can feel free to tear it apart, man. Just go crazy, steal on steel. I think the time we spent trying to understand and mitigate human error was wasted. I, I think that it doesn't matter nearly as much as we once thought it did. I'm now opening the floor for discussion. Well, let me jump in on that, Todd. This is Tony. Um, the issue is, uh, to me, a management issue. Uh, human error is something that we all experience every day. Multiple, some of us more than others, uh, uh, but it's something that you know we intend to do and we forget to do it, or we do things that we did not intend to do. And that's a fact of life. And so my take on human error is that some things absolutely have to go right first time every time, such as uh, 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 a surgeon in an operating room has to has to make the incisions in the right place and, and, and touch the right things. Uh, a pilot has to fly an aircraft a, a certain way. And uh, operators at nuclear power plants have to perform their activities uh, 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 for the most part flawlessly. And so certain activities cannot experience human error. Or if they do, there has to be some way of of, uh, either uh, making it error tolerant or some way of reversing the outcome before suffering serious harm. Can I jump in a minute? Because I love what you're saying. But I'm saying that once you talk about increasing tolerance, then air goes from something a worker chooses to do or not to do, is something you can manage or not manage, and you actually manage a system so it's tolerant of the air. Yeah, I, I agree with that. But there are certain activities that are not tolerant, and you'll remember my idea of critical steps. All right. Yes. So those are those activities are not tolerant of human error. But I, I would just say that there are very few, in actuality, there should be very few critical steps. There should be. There should be, but there are. That's the there thing. Are. I say that I think that systems are being made more error tolerant. And one of the things you bring up is, is this idea of aviation and pilots can't make mistakes. Well, I'm a pilot and I make a lot of mistakes. Mm-hmm. What what is the benefit of the mistake is that I have the opportunity to learn. Like Todd says frequently, error without consequence is a gift. So I think that it depends on where we look at error. If we look at error retroactively, there's a lot of danger in that because usually that's a judgment that's based on the outcome of the event. But if we look at error sort of in situ, if I can recognize that I made a mistake, that mistake then offers an opportunity for me to learn. So maybe it's it's got some it's it's a nuance of language and it's a, it's right. definitely how we feel when we hear that word error that makes us think about different things the consequences of punishment the consequences of punitive action that's all the retroactive stuff right. but up front or in situ is there value in error and recognizing it? right I think uh, I'm, Ivan I think that uh, this idea of uh, uh, of our response to human error after the fact, after there's some unwanted outcome, I think we'll all be in agreement that that's an improper approach uh, uh, to uh, uh, human performance and system reliability and resilience. But what I'm getting at is I think human error is has value in the uh, what we do before the activity. Uh, there are activities that we have to plan in such a way such that they be, that those critical steps are performed flawlessly uh, every time, and so I that's where I see the, the value of it. I I still think we're talking about the wrong thing, and and I I actually went back and reread James Reason's book, uh, Managing the Risks of Organizational Accidents, where he defines errors and mistakes, 
and he he defines errors as slips and lapses and fumbles and but it's it's where you get the wrong action and the wrong outcome ensues and what we know in the new view is that usually when you get an error with the wrong action you, it usually goes well it usually goes okay now reason distinguishes that from mistakes where you have the right action but you end up with the wrong outcome and so you know if we can agree on that you know you know between an error and a mistake um, we might be coming along to, to better agreement. Right. But, but does that make sense? Oh, it does to me. Uh, and I have my only nuanced differentiation from that, from what Bill, uh, James Reason defines as an error. I look at error as simply the behavior. It's an action. So it's a, it's a behavior that unintention, right. unintentionally deviates from a preferred action. And, right. uh, and what I consider a preferred action is the action that that preserves the integrity of the asset or assets that a person's working with. I have a little problem with that one. <laughs> um, so I'm big in the firefighting business right now, obviously, and I'm looking at firefighting system being a complex adaptive system. And so if we look at things as decisions in that in that battleground that we call fire, then we could say that that decision was an error. But really, in a complex system, the decision is more of an experiment. I'm going to try something and see if it works. Now, can we have error in experimentation? Yeah, I agree. I think you can. So tell me more, because I'm not sure that I, I'm not sure that we have an error. I think we have an experiment that yielded a result, but I'm not sure that that's an error. Well, I'm going back, you know, to 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 an earlier statement that you know. Throughout the day, we're going to experience uh, 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 mishaps or fumbles, trips, lapses, slips, stumbles, and these are things that we don't plan as experiments. They're just part of the human nature. That's who we are. And so, you know, we misspell words. We 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 just make mistakes throughout the day. And so, what I'm saying is we have to anticipate those situations that absolutely have to go right. And so, so what I'm looking at is more the proactive approach is not so much the reactive uh, uh, perspective or the learning perspective, which I think is necessary and I think is valuable. Uh, I don't think I, I, I disagree with anybody that, uh, that's on this phone call, but in terms of before people put their hands to the controls, we have to think in advance. We have to, that's part of the, the one of the cornerstones of risk of, uh, of resilience engineering is anticipate where do things have to go right? Where do we can where where are those situations where we cannot experience or suffer variation from human nature? So let me let me interrupt then to ask this question because because I think we're in the same place. But the question then becomes, do we manage error? Or do we manage the system's tolerance for that failure to happen? Because where I would really push you, and, and this is what I've become interested in, is I think we've sold for years a bill of goods to people that says we can actually manage error. And I don't think error is a choice. It's, it's an unintended, right? That's your definition. I, I don't think we manage the absence or presence of error. In fact, Adrian Cockcroft said in the podcast this week, if you guys heard it, that the first thing that made him switch thinking about how to design highly reliable systems was when he figured out that you cannot legislate against human error. You can't mm -hmm. make a rule or a policy against human error. I don't think we manage the absence or presence of error. I think we manage the system's resilience or tolerance. Or tolerance. To manage that error. I, I agree with so, that. So, so this is Bob Edwards. I I think as, as an engineer and as you know, doing all these operational learning teams that I've done hundreds of now, uh, I think error is just almost boring. I I think it's just it's just super normal. It just but it seems like to me that error is so normal. I'm afraid of, and what I see happening sometimes is that if we believe we can manage the error, then we start doing things. I saw a company do this. Started doing human factors investigations which was a whole new way to write people up. You didn't use three-way communications. You didn't use alphanumerics. You didn't, you know, we trained you on these things. You did, 
And we had to stop them and say, stop, what are you doing? Well, they didn't use these things. If they had used those, we wouldn't have had the error. No, I, I don't know. I think even some of the things that I thought were error prevention, like three-way communications when I'm flying a helicopter, I, I don't really think it's an error prevention. I think it's just the way you communicate when you hand over controls because these small helicopters don't fly themselves. So I don't know. That's kind of where I'm parked at now is that I'm kind of losing interest in error because it just seems so, it just seems so prevalent and so normal. Bob, this is Tony. I, I, going back to, to, I would agree with what you're saying. It is normal. And that's why we have to think about it in terms of where the risk is in our operations. Uh, just go back to what everybody's uh, familiar with, driving your car. I mean, we, when we get in our car and we, we start backing out our driveway, uh, where do we stop? We stop the car just before we enter the line of fire. We go, we or, just, or, when, or when we hit the trash can. <laughs> or when we hit the trash can, right. And so, but, but certain, certain activities are more important than others. Like, you know, just driving out your, your, your subdivision, not a whole lot of traffic. You may not be paying attention when you back your car out into the street. Uh, and so sometimes we can, we can afford to make a mistake there. But once we get out to the main road, we're a, we're a lot more cautious. And what do we do when we come up to an intersection? We slow down. And most of us stop for the most part. You know, the wheels may be turning a little bit. But I've taught myself to stop at stop signs because sometimes I may not see a vehicle in the intersection. But, but have you ever done that and completely come to a stop and look both ways and really think you've done a good job and pull out and somebody's right there? Yeah. I mean, have you still, ever oh, yeah. So going back to Todd's question, we, st we have to do both. We have to look at not only avoiding critical mistakes, but at the same time, we have to design the system that defends the assets, that, that, that protects the things that are important to us after we do make a mistake. So I think we have to do both. Yeah, and I totally agree with you about critical steps. Those are the most important things that you do well. You know, jumping out of an airplane, you've got to have your main chute and your reserve chute, and all those things got to be in good shape. So I mean, I, I totally get the, the critical step thing. That makes sense. Yeah, and that's and I don't care about all the other errors. The ones I'm concerned about is avoiding the the critical mistake. It's it's too late once you're out of the aircraft to think, oh, you know, I forgot to, to check the reserve chute. Yeah, you know, right. that's too late. So I'm I'm really struggling with some of the things that 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 we're bringing up because I see that there are certain things that are within our our ability to predict, but there are things that lie outside our ability to predict. Yes, I agree. And I think once we hit that, you know, it's kind of like we, we can define error up to a point, perhaps where we have normative standards. Somebody brought up spelling. That's a normative standard. I think that was you, Tony. Yeah, sure. Okay. Well, yeah, there are correct ways to spell, and sometimes we socially construct what is correct around spelling. Mm -hmm. For example, the British spelling certain words like center, and the and the American spelling words like center. Right. So we, there's even variability in that level of correctness. But there are normative standards. There are consequences in some types of error. I'll I'll give you that. And I think that as we discover those, we can engineer in things that can protect us from the things that we can anticipate or predict. But I think that when we start using error in areas where prediction is outside of our ability, and we start using that term to describe some sort of behavior, that we've crossed a line that no longer serves us in any way, shape, or form. It doesn't make the system better to call it an error. It doesn't make the person better to call it an error. It is something that lies outside our, our ability to predict, and therefore it really isn't a behavior, and it isn't a, it isn't a, an error. It, it is, <laughs> I, I don't know if we can call it a mistake. I like to think more that it's an experiment that had a, had a specific outcome, may not have been the desired outcome, but it was an experiment. And what I see over and over and over again in fire is guys experimenting, guys and gals experimenting, and they get a result, and then they come back and they say, well, that worked, so I'm going to apply it the next time. Mm -hmm. And if they apply it three times in a row, then it becomes a standard, and then they call it an error if they don't get the outcome that they predicted. Mm -hmm. But I think that they're misusing the term, too, I th and I don't think that it's particularly valuable for them. 
It almost sounds like, Ivan, that uh, it, what, what you call an experiment is similar to what uh, Eric Kolnagel calls an adjustment. I mean, Eric and I have talked about this in the past. I don't think I used the word experiment then. And by the way, I don't know that experiment's the right word. Uh, I'll tell you that. I would love to get some help on this because if I, if I go to my firefighters and I tell them they're experimenting, they look at me like I'm crazy. Well, here, here's, my, here's my contention, and this is perhaps the main reason I, I suggested that we have somewhat of a debate on this, is that managers need to, I think managers, uh, 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 blind managers of your high hazard uh, industrial operations, uh, it's human error is still a, a common phrase, and they understand that phrase. And, uh, and, and so what we, we're trying to do is help those line managers anticipate what they can anticipate. That's one of the key features, one of the cornerstones of resilience. Of resilience. And so that's, a, that's something we do have to pay attention to. And if we can anticipate a critical mistake and put in appropriate controls and defenses uh, to to, to uh, avoid losing control, and that's the way I look at human error is losing control. Then uh, then let's do it, all right. But then you're right; we can't anticipate everything that we can anticipate. It scares me that we're we're selling the idea that we manage error, I, I, and what? that's that's where I'd really push you is that I don't think we manage error. I think we manage we really manage the systems in which high risk work critical task, whatever you want to call it. I think, Those systems yeah, I think are done. you have to do both, Todd. That's the thing. The, then if you believe you can manage error, then you believe error is a choice. And I think once managers hear that, they, they jump off on it and they think this is another way to manage bad workers. Uh, well, here's what I'm getting at. You know, when, when people do critical work, what we're really managing is the behavior. We're making sure the behavior goes right a certain way. That's the work as imagined. Would you agree? When it's predictable, when the system delivers that which is expected routinely, then you might be you might you might have the opportunity to develop those things. But but I think that as systems become more complex as the as the limitations of the engineering are realized or the limitations of the complexity of the system are realized that we're no longer in that same discussion. I think that at that point, it changes radically, and it's no longer a behavior. And if that's what you're trying to manage, and, and I, was it you, Tony, that's losing control? Yeah. You, this is something you never have control of. And I think that that's a, a, something that we have to start to realize, is that in complex adaptive systems, there are things that we simply only influence at best. And then when we influence them, they can change in ways that we didn't predict. And I don't think that that's necessarily an error. That's more of an organic or biologic system response, that, that, more of that type of an analogy, and less of an engineering sort of analogy. But there, this is why we have procedures. we got to have procedures. People have to be given some direction on what they do. If, if the system is so complex that we can't follow procedure, then why are we using people to begin with? Well, people may be the only ones that can make sense of the situation as it unfolds. Well, then it must not be that complex. Learn in the well. You're suggesting that human brains aren't very complex or can't handle complex problems. I would suggest that the opposite is true. Oh, that yeah. your first line of defense in a complex system is a is group sense making, learning, and improvisation. Right. And, and that's not procedural. That is improvising at the point of work after you take in as much as the group can take in in terms of information. Mm -hmm. And then, again, you're making somewhat of an informed decision. And, again, I'm, I, I use decision with trepidation because I, I know that if, that if it has a bad outcome, then it was the wrong decision, and I, I want to try and avoid that because, mm -hmm. again, that's a judgment based on outcome. And what I'd rather say is that the group comes together and they develop – an adaptation or an improvisation that fits the information that they have and they try it and then they see what they get. And that's the best that we can expect from that situation. And I would add to that, that, that the no, thinking of a mistake as a behavior actually builds in the sort of that, that old saw that will we manage behaviors that every accident is a result of an unsafe act or and all that kind of stuff. And, and that, I think that moves us backwards in, in at least the new view thinking. I don't think so, Todd. 
I, I really don't think so. There's there's actions that people are taking that can that can be anticipated, and we can put those in procedures for the most part. I'm I'm really I am talking about safety one perspective, but that'll take you up to a certain level, and then we adopt the safety two or the new view. But it's not either or; it's both and. That's what I'm suggesting. You got to anticipate the critical errors and put in the controls to avoid those errors, and in some cases, proceduralize it. Sometimes we had this conversation earlier. There, there are some techniques called human performance tools that people can use to to make sure they don't make critical mistakes that uh, that ha- that have been put in place by exemplars, people that have shown that they make fewer mistakes than others. So, so I'm saying that there is a risk to be managed because people do make mistakes. And it's, I agree, it's difficult to anticipate exactly when and where those mistakes will happen. But if we know certain things have to go right, let's make sure they go right. Bill, well, I thinking? agree with that. But you know what, what, ha- what I see, and I think what we tend to see in, in our respective businesses, is that you, you focus on both, which is error reduction and management of error-prone systems or error-provoking systems. And the, but the management emphasis, it, it goes to the error reduction or error prevention Mm-hmm. rather than management of the systems that it could be more error tolerant. I and, agree. And, and so I, I think that as practitioners, if, if you know, we might touch on errors, but, but we should go straight to the safety two stuff in management of complex adaptive systems because in, in technically complex um, businesses or industries, that's kind of where we are. Mm-hmm. Um, if it was simple, we wouldn't be there. Um, <laughs> That's right. So, you know, so the you know our, our audience are the people who are in complex adaptive, high hazard industries where there is some risk to people, the environment, or or systems, and and we know implicitly that managing the systems gets us the biggest bang for the buck, but managers who don't understand safety too tend to default to error reduction or error proofing, mm-hmm. you know, and, and I think that's kind of, where, you know, where Todd is driving. So th- does that make sense? Yeah, I kind of like where you're going, Bill. Um, I, I think that Tony's right. You know, if we, if there is something that's accessible, that's predictable, it's, it, it runs the same way. We have to build in those defenses and we have to do the things that, that are necessary to maintain um, to maintain the behaviors within a certain norm for a normative set of standards. Right. If that's well, possible, it, I think but we you have can, to... You can, you can mistake proof. So there yes. are techniques to engineer mistake proofing, and, you know, like your car key. You know, you could, yes. It doesn't make any difference how you put it in. It's going to be right. That's a mistake proof. Yeah, see, and that's why I like what you said, Bill, because I think what you're, what you're tapping into is that in those situations where things are fit into a category of solvable, they are problems to be solved, and, this, and the, there's a limited set of solutions for those problems that are correct solutions, then you're absolutely right. And for that, we need to build those defenses in depth, and that's exactly where we need to invest time and procedures. And, and to that end, I think we're right. But I think when we really start talking about error that exists outside of that, then we're in a completely different place. And that's, I think, the most probably the most interesting place to be. No offense, Tony, but I think it's kind of low-hanging fruit to deal with the other piece. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. Lots of tools, lots of procedures, lots of admonishments, public flogging, all those wonderful things that we've done in the past for those types of errors. But if we, if we cross that line into this other area, the gray area that most people work in, in fact, why we have people in those areas is because they're the only ones who can do the kind of sense-making, learning, and improvisation that's necessary in a complex system. Mm-hmm. Then all of a sudden, when we apply error in that circumstance, it is, it's, it is definitely an admonishment. And what, it, what I think it really does in that case is it distances us from the ability to learn from that event. Because you've shut down the conversation through punishment. Yeah, even though the punishment is only a social punishment of, of 
labeling something as an error when the person knows that it wasn't an error. They know in their heart that it wasn't an error. They were doing the best they could with the information that they had at the time. Yeah, and it wasn't even a choice. It wasn't a choice either. Exactly. Right. And, and I think we struggle with even saying the word error. I mean, we're saying it a lot tonight, but when we get right down to it, I'm, I'm not even sure we understand what that what that really means. Is it a choice? Is it not a choice? Is it a slip? You know, what is it really? And, uh, you, you know, you're calling it an experiment. Whole Nagel calls it an adaption. Um, but we struggle with that. And, and Todd and I have had that conversation over the years where we really struggled about that. And, and I think it's an uninteresting, I, I've come to believe that it's an uninteresting conversation at some point. Yeah, I'm standing alone here among the four of us or the three of us. But we love but you. I, we, I, love I, you. we love you. <laughs> but but I'm, I, I, I insist it's something that we have to look at to avoid. I think that the, the real important thing is not the decision or action or label that we place on it. Instead, I think the important thing are the conditions that surrounded that decision or action. That's where we have the most leverage. And if we don't look at those, those, those conditions as being causal, if instead we look at those things as being influential, we get to open up a much richer dialogue with both our workforce and our leadership because now we've moved to a very different place in the conversation. We've moved to a place where we can, we can have empathy. We can start to understand the actions in the context that we're talking about. We can start to then say, what are the systemic drivers inside this system for which the organization has their own influence or even control? Because there, if there is a possibility that the organization can control those things. And what I'm going to say, Tony, is I bet we're really in agreement around this. Oh, yeah. I, I totally agree with the context. In fact, I, I like to, I talk to, uh, to the, the, to the uh, issue of local factors. You know, there's a set of local factors that influence people's decisions, their choices in the workplace. But there's still the act that absolutely has to go right. The, the reality is, so I was dealing with a client who, who works with cranes, and, and they dropped something. And, and so it was a, a, a very expensive asset that they were lifting, and the crane operator went down and set up and dropped the, the load. Mm. And, and, and I said, was this a a critical engineered lift? And he says, absolutely. And I said, so what were the critical steps? Mm. And he, he, there was this long pause and he went, they're all critical. <laughs> and, and, and he just didn't get it. So, um, it's, it, he didn't understand the context. And, and so I think for us, once you recognize what a critical step is, then you start then, in the context. That's correct. That's correct. That's where contact is very important. And part of that context is error traps. I'm a big believer in error traps. And so, so I'm thinking if there's some error traps along associated with, an, with, a, with a particular critical step, then let's see what we can do to minimize the influence or impact of those, of those conditions on that critical step. See, I don't think you minimize in as much as you build in. So I think one, yeah. of the, one of the great shifts in thinking that's happening right now is that it's not we try to remove or manage air. It's we build air into the system, and we build systems that are resilient, tolerant enough that they can manage the inevitable airs that are there. The point is, though, is you do, you do have some protocols associated with certain operations. And, and people still make mistakes. Even though we have the protocols, we have the procedures, we have the checklists, we still make mistakes, and that's where the defense and depth has to be built in. But if I can interrupt one more time, it would be to say that we've sold a bill of goods to people that says the protocols and procedures will actually reduce the air. And it doesn't reduce mm -hmm. the air because I don't think air is manageable that way. I don't think we reduce air because oh, air is un it's, it's, it's unintentional. They absolutely do reduce air. Well, then, then, you, then you don't believe air is – you believe air is intentional, Right. Because if, no. air, if air is unintentional, no. you can't ask me to not do it and have any impact on me doing it. That's, right? that's why you have procedures. The whole idea of procedures is we can't remember everything that is, is necessary for the proper sequence. Right. Yeah, but procedures only work until, until they don't, really. So, you know, I, I was in the Air Force flying C-130s. I was in the Coast Guard flying C-130s. We had, in the, in the Coast Guard, two books that we used to fly the airplane. 
the operating manual for the aircraft and the performance manual for the Air Force. I mean, for the aircraft. In the Air Force, we had 75 pounds of publications to which we would be held accountable for any error that we made in that in those publications. And I can tell you now that there were rules that were in, in opposition from one another, rules that didn't make sense, rules that couldn't be applied to every situation, and procedures that couldn't be applied to every situation. Despite the, the desire on the part of the Air Force to completely reduce error from the system, they couldn't do it even with 75 pounds of publications. I think, so, you're, I think you're misunderstanding me. I'm not saying that all procedures are going to prevent all error, but the whole purpose of a procedure is to avoid error. Um, that, well, that's, that's, where, that's where they come from. And, and, but, but I can agree with you that, that you, know, you, can't, you can't proceduralize error away. That's just impossible, but that doesn't mean we got to get rid of procedures. We got we can't get, just get rid of all checklists because they don't avoid error. No, I can correct Tony, but but the procedure presumes a certain level of competence on the part of the operator, right? Uh, in terms of knowledge and ability and experience to be able to perform it as the procedure writer imagined it. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. So we can't get rid of procedures. But the whole purpose of is advocating for that, Tony. I, I think that I think that what we're saying, well, at least what I'm saying, I won't speak, speak for everybody, but I think what I'm saying is that procedures have a place. For example, novices need procedures. Mm -hmm. When we get to expert level performance, expert level performance offer, often operates outside of procedures. Right. Expert level performance is often adaptive, mm -hmm. and I think that that's an important thing to realize because in that adaptation, they're frequently building different things into the system. It could be efficiency. It could be thoroughness that they're developing or they're building into the system. So I think that when we get to that point, we could easily say, based on the outcome, that the, that the adaptation by the expert is a deviation from the procedure. But really, what is it doing and why are they doing it? That's the most important piece of it. The action itself is almost uninteresting. My caution is, is we cannot just simply say we're not going to use the word human error anymore and we don't have to worry about it. I think that's wrong to, to tell managers we don't have to worry about human error in light of critical steps. Those actions that absolutely have to go right. Certain things have to go right first time every time. But in most high hazard industries, there's, there are relatively few critical steps or should be. And if there are, the, then they need to figure out how to whittle those down so that they're a smaller number. When the system is normal, whatever normal is, when the system is normal, then the procedures work and the processes work and all the checklists work and all that stuff. But we could have machines doing a lot of that stuff. Mm -hmm. It's when the, the system delivers that which isn't normal and we judge the outcome of that to be, to be associated with a behavioral error that right. we lose the ability to learn from that event. And, and that's the piece that I think that, that is, I mean, we've said it a couple of times, but that's the piece I think that's really important is that, yes, you're absolutely right, Tony, if the system delivers exactly what you expect, you can follow a procedure and everything will work. Harness lock, landing, you're down and lock, brakes, parking brake, off brakes, pump firm, gear down, flaps down, landing checks complete. I still remember the checklist for the T-34 <laughs> that flew in, in Navy flight school before landing checklist, right? So, yes, and for a novice, that is critical because that's all a novice has. Right, right. right. Once we move into that area where now I select the landing gear handle down and I see an anomaly, now I'm in a very different place, and I've got to do things in a very different way. And there may or may not be procedures for that particular malfunction. Mm -hmm. And having had that particular malfunction where there was no procedure, I had to adapt on the fly. No pun intended. Okay, pun intended. Yeah. I had to adapt on the fly to try and figure out what options I had available. And at that point, it was no longer uh, a decision or an action. It was a collaboration. It was making sense of what I had. And then it was building margin for a successful outcome. And success, by the way, changed, right? So successful outcome is landing and taxiing to where you want to taxi to and getting out of the airplane. In this particular case, it was putting two mains on the ground and allowing the nose slowly to come to rest on the, on the tarmac and coming to a skid someplace close to the center line. 
So success actually changes at that point. And that's why I say it's very difficult in those circumstances to call anything an error. Yeah, I'm not disagreeing with you, Ivan. I just uh, I think that uh, even in those situations, you can still make a mistake. I don't know that you could define what a mistake would be in those situations until you've got the outcome. That's the problem. Because mm-hmm. I don't know what a mistake would be in that circumstance until I've made it and I've had an outcome. Mm-hmm. And that's a problem because then it's not in the it's not a behavioral issue. It's I'm experimenting with the unknown. I'm in the unknown. Right. And that's why I have a, a hard time with even the, the notion of of, of uh, labeling anything in that in that realm as erroneous or even as a behavior. I think it's someplace between a decision and an action. And it's it's influenced by a whole bunch of contextual factors. Um so if we're if we don't go to the extremes, if we get away from the binary opposites of right and wrong and good and bad, um, if we instead think about this as a massive gray area in which the worker is working, because it is a gray area, it's complex, then we're someplace between, on this spectrum, someplace between a decision, which is a very deliberative thing, and an action, which is a response to stimulus. And I think that what cognitive science is showing is that most things that people do are someplace between those two ends of the spectrum. And so when we call it, when we label it as a behavior, well, is the behavior that I'm being intuitive, is that the behavior that you're talking about? Or is the behavior that I'm being deliberative and I'm coming up with a quote, wrong answer? And how would you know? And how would you know? The more important here, I'll, 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 I'll give you some hope here. The more important feature of the management issue is is the resilience part, the defense in depth, right? Is you know how do you how do you design a system to accommodate when people do make mistakes at a critical step? And I think so. What, it's error tolerance. And what I see in the world is that there's a belief that we don't have to make the system resilient if we could make the workers less error prone. And that's uh, that's dangerous. Yeah, it's, it's pretty common. I mean, it's it's out there all the time, and it's scary. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But we still, you know, we think we think that error is sin. There's a common belief among many managers and even workers that when people make mistakes, there's an immoral act associated with that with that error, and that's another misunderstanding about error. Error is simply a behavior that triggers an outcome. Or I'm struggling with the idea that error is a behavior. You're going to have to give me a little bit more to go on because I, I'm not I'm not seeing that in any of the accidents that I've looked at yeah. or incidents in the Forest Service. Yeah, I look at error as an action and not so much a cognitive decision. I look at what's the error in the action, and there may be some decisions cognitively that were made before the action. And I would suggest there are two fundamental truths and and. These are ones that are open for debate, but I would suggest that one is you can't you can't legislate against error. You can't ever write a checklist that will ensure there will be no error, and that ultimately you can't predict what's going to fail next. What was that last part, Todd? You can't predict what's going to fail next. Uh huh. I agree. And so then then you're in a problem where you've got this really complex system that you're trying to manage the best you can, and um, you're sort of up against it. What do you has this been yeah. a good talk? Have you enjoyed this talk? Oh yeah. I, I, yeah. In fact, <laughs> in fact, I want to spend you more, want to meet Tony. I, gotta, I want to spend more time with Ivan. I understand firefighting better. Everyone wants to spend more time with Ivan. He's totally <laughs> worth spending time with. I'll tell you this. Um I got to bring this ship back to shore at some point. Um so so <laughs> do we have to stop? Uh, a little bit. So let's go around the horn. Any final comments? We'll go Bill, Tony, Ivan and then we're out. All right. I just think that, um, it, you know, it, as I say, I'm going to end where I started, which is errors are, I think they're, you need to understand it. Um, but the, the more we get into it, the more uninteresting it becomes. And that's all I have to say. Yeah. I believe that uh, human error is still a risk that must be managed proactively. And I think that's the key aspect of, uh, of the anticipate element of uh, the of, of the uh, corner the anticipate uh, cornerstone of, of resilience engineering, and so it's it's a uh, hazard that managers can look 
look to in advance for critical steps. Make sure those critical steps go right first time every time. And uh, when error does happen, I, I fully I think there's opportunity to learn from it and to understand that error has its roots in the system that surrounds that operation or that task. And so fundamentally, I believe human error is a loss of control. So I'm going to go to Teddy Roosevelt because I can. Teddy says, it's not the critic who counts. It's not the man who points out the strong man's stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, who, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there's no effort without error mm -hmm. and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds? Who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions? Who spends himself in a worthy cause? Who, at the best, knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly. Always good to end with the Teddy Roosevelt quote. That's it, man. What do you think? That was the big debate on human error. It was super fun to do, but technically that was a tough thing, man. Holy cow. So um, to bring you up to speed, Bob's Skype fell out about halfway through, and we could never get him back. But it didn't matter because he started having a robot voice, so he couldn't really understand him anyway. So I think he expanded the bandwidth of Family Camp as far as he possibly could to be on that debate. Thanks to Tony. Thanks to Ivan. Thanks to Bill. Thanks to Bob. Thanks to you. Thank you for listening to the podcast. I hope this one is thoughtful. Uh, there's clear biases here. I can tell you that we did not come to an agreement, even though we acted like we did. We're gentlemen. So there was gentlemanly rule following there the entire way. But uh, there's some different viewpoints in that little uh, uh, discussion. There's a clear linear engineering-centric world. There's a clear nonlinear, more complex view. They're all kind of there, and they're well represented. It was super fun, and I bet we'll do it again. Thanks for listening. Uh, please subscribe, and I don't care how you do it or what it takes. Tell your peers and friends in this world to listen to this podcast. It is getting really good. The content is all of a sudden super, super good. Not that it was bad, but holy crap, now it's like a graduate course. Um, until then, learn something new every single day. I bet you did today. Have as much fun as you possibly can. And for goodness sakes, be safe. Todd, this is Tony. Can you hear me? Yeah, you sound good. You sound younger and hipper, Tony. <clears throat> yeah, I just took a young pill today. <laughs> Can you send some of those out to us?